The Tom Woods Show, episode 940. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, I don't know what your problems are, but I can't imagine you have any that couldn't be solved by a free ebook from me. These books help you win debates, and they're fun to read. Check them out at tomsfreebooks.com. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here. You know, last year, when I was on the Contra Cruise, which is the annual cruise I co-host with Bob Murphy, I was, it was actually just before the Contra Cruise. I was in the hotel room the night before, and I was preparing some episodes. And I remember I prepared an episode where I took a lecture from my libertyclassroom.com website, and I made that into an episode of the show because I had so many episodes to cover while I was gone. Well, I'm out of town right now, and I've recorded about the last, oh, I don't know, 817 episodes or something in advance so that I could go out of town. But I'm running out of energy. (laughs) I'm running out of steam. So I'm going to treat you to another free sample from Liberty Classroom. This is a really good one, though, because this has got some terms in there that a lot of people hear thrown around, but they're not so sure they could really define if they had to. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to have Jason Jewell, who's been on this show before, walk you through part of his course on the history of conservatism and libertarianism at Liberty Classroom. He's he's going to walk you through the terms neoconservatism, which is, you know, a lot of people say, all right, I've heard the term, I roughly know what a neocon is, but uh, that's about all I know. And also Straussianism. Now, you may be less likely to have heard of the Straussians, but the Straussians also are important to know. They're also everywhere and extremely annoying. So <laughs> they're good to know to watch out for. So he's going to talk about in his in his usual restrained and scholarly way that, that I very much envy, Jason will talk to you about these very important aspects of the intellectual history of the American right, let's say. Jason is the chairman of the Department of Humanities at Faulkner University and overall just a very, very smart guy. He blogs at the Western Tradition, that's the name of his blog, which is westerntradition.wordpress.com. And on there, he has pledged to read, it's an enormous project he's taken on himself, to read the entirety of the great books of the Western tradition. And he's doing so by reading the 60-volume Great Books of the Western World series and the preliminary 10-volume Gateway to the Great Books. So this is an absolutely enormous project, and he's going through and reading every page and then writing blog posts commenting on what he's read. And it is, it's already taken years and years of work, and he's still doing it, and he tells you what he's going to be reading, so if you'd like to follow along with him and learn along with him, you can easily do that. He's doing this all just as a service. He's doing it all for free. So if that interests you, check out westerntradition.wordpress.com. I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 940, which is the show notes page for today. And, of course, you should join libertyclassroom.com. It's my flagship product. It's the history and economics they never taught you that you can hear in your car or you know wherever you are, whenever you are, on whatever device you want while you're driving around or whatever, and you can learn the real stuff. So libertyclassroom.com, get yourself a discount at libertyclassroom.com slash coupons. All right, here we go. Here, for your listening and intellectual pleasure, is Jason Jewell. Hi, and welcome to Lecture 24 of A History of Conservatism and Libertarianism. This lecture is titled The Straussians and Neoconservatives. We're going to begin the lecture by examining the figure of Leo Strauss, an important political philosopher whose thought ended up having an influence on the conservative movement. We'll talk a little bit about uh, his most influential followers. And then we'll turn to the neoconservatives. Now, I should say at the outset here that Straussians and neoconservatives are not necessarily the same people. There is a tendency among uh, some conservatives and libertarians to sort of uh, conflate the two to talk about the Straussians and neoconservatives interchangeably, but they are different groups of thinkers. Uh, 
Uh, there is some overlap among their ideas, and hopefully as we go through the lecture, <clears throat> some of that will become a little bit clearer. But we'll begin by talking about Leo Strauss and then say a little bit about the circumstances of the 1960s that lead this uh, group of leftists to move to the right uh, on the political spectrum and become known as neoconservatives. Neoconservatism can really be understood as a right-wing branch of liberalism uh, in, in some cases, and we'll see as we get further into the lecture how there are uh, serious differences between the neoconservatives and the more traditional conservatives, whether you want to talk about the traditionalist strand of conservatism or the libertarians. Uh, but we'll look at a few of the leading neoconservative figures, and I'm not going to go all the way into the conflict that eventually develops between the neoconservatives and other groups on the right in the post-Cold War period. I'll refer to some of those conflicts in a later lecture. All right, so we'll start with Leo Strauss, whose dates are 1899 to 1973. Strauss was a political philosopher, a political science professor at the University of Chicago. And remember that we've seen several figures who are at the University of Chicago at one point or another in the mid 20th century. Hayek was there. Richard Weaver was there. We already mentioned um, also Robert Hutchins and Mortimer Adler, who were uh, important in getting the great books movement started. Well, Strauss is interacting with several of these other figures, and he brings an emphasis which was really unusual in the mid-20th century in the field of political science, bringing an emphasis to classical political philosophy. And Strauss wrote a lot about the idea of natural right, and the natural law tradition. But, but Strauss argued that there was a significant break between the ancient uh, political philosophers such as Plato and Aristotle and the modern political philosophers who he started tracing the modern political philosophy with Machiavelli and then developing through other figures such as John Locke. Now in Strauss's view, the ancient political philosophers were superior to the modern political philosophers. And again, this was a very unusual view. But <clears throat> for Strauss, the big difference between the two groups was that the ancients focused on ideals. Someone like Plato, for example, would spend a lot of time trying to figure out the ideal political system, fully recognizing that this ideal could probably never be implemented in the real world. But <clears throat> Strauss believed there was a great value for a political philosopher to spend time contemplating ideals and to try to figure out what is the absolute best way to organize political affairs. So there's this idea of uh, the ought, what ought a political system look like, even if we can never quite get there because of the failings of human nature. On the other hand, Strauss believed that the modern political philosophers, starting with Machiavelli, kind of lowered their sights, so to speak, and didn't contemplate what the best possible system was. Instead, they simply took the world as they found it and said, how can we maneuver the best uh, within this environment. And Machiavelli, <clears throat> according to Strauss, sort of paved the way for philosophers like Hobbes and Locke, for whom the uh, the goal was simply a kind of comfortable self-preservation. So let's just try to arrange things so that we can uh, live comfortable lives the best we can. And that, that's, that's something that falls short in his view of the vision of the ancient philosophers like Aristotle who would say, now, the political community is there to try to help the citizens towards virtue, you know, some higher goal. So Strauss believed that, you know, philosophy had taken a wrong turn with Machiavelli. Now, Strauss <clears throat> stressed the reading of the great books, particularly in political philosophy. But he had <clears throat> a particular way of reading and interpreting the great books. And, and this kind of sets him apart from... Mortimer Adler and, and some others, Strauss said, yes, we want to do close reading of the great books, but <clears throat> Strauss wants to sort of a decontextualize these books. In, in other words, you don't pay attention really to the historical context of the works. 
In fact, uh, if you pay attention to the historical context, you're going to misread the great books because the great books are these timeless things. And the uh, writers of the great books, like Plato, were not uh, reflections of their own time and space. They were sort of these transcendent figures who helped to uh, bring in completely new ideas that then influenced later generations. But those great authors themselves are not really influenced by their own historical circumstances. Well, obviously, this is a very debatable proposition. But Strauss said that we just want to focus on the text itself without really consideration of historical context. This has a lot of overlap with that uh, new criticism in literary theory that I've mentioned a couple of times in previous lectures and that also is very influential in the middle of the 20th century. So Strauss believed that if you were paying attention to historical circumstances and the context in which these great works were written, that you were guilty of historicism and that you were not going to really appreciate the truth with a capital T that is uh, manifested in these great works. Now, this has always been a, a controversial contention among historians because by denigrating the idea of historical context and uh, tradition, by extension, Strauss is attacking Edmund Burke, who, of course, is a very significant figure uh, in conservative thought. But in Strauss's view, if you take Burke's position that uh, political forms should be organic and grow out of the shared experience of a people, then you're cutting yourself off from appreciating the great contributions of a philosopher like Aristotle. And he says, you're on the road to a sort of um, Hegelian um, progressivism. And for Strauss, this was a, a horrible thing. And um, moreover, when you take that view of historicism, in, in his opinion, you are inviting these kind of radical critiques and uh, and rejoinders by figures like Friedrich Nietzsche or Martin Heidegger in the 20th century, <clears throat> who are, um, I, I don't really want to go into Nietzsche and Heidegger here, I mean, I could really get off the rails trying to uh, explain the philosophy of those guys, but uh, these, these are um, radical opponents of the great political and philosophical tradition of the West in Strauss's view. So historicism, in his uh, in his opinion, is bad. Now, this uh, some of Strauss's followers could take this idea of attacking historicism to a, an extreme degree. I mean, I've heard stories of people who have gone to Liberty Fund conferences and other kinds of kinds of gatherings where some Straussian will uh, accuse one of the members of the of the discussion of being a historicist simply because the uh, other person had said, we need to understand you know, when that writer from this earlier century used this particular word, it's important for us to understand what that word meant uh, to the people who used it in that particular time. And then this in invites the accusation of historicism. Well, to any trained historian, I mean, obviously, you do have to pay attention to the historical context and the meaning of words in their historical context. So this... Um, this radical anti-historical look can really go to extremes. Maybe Strauss didn't go quite that far with some of it, but some of his followers certainly did. <clears throat> Strauss also had a distinctive approach to the question of Athens and Jerusalem. Now, this is one of the great debates in the history of the Christian church, first articulated by the uh, Latin church father Tertullian uh, in the second and third century. What has Athens to do with Jerusalem? In other words, what does the classical philosophical tradition have to do with the tradition of faith and revelation? These are represented by these two cities, Athens and Jerusalem. Well, Strauss believed that Athens and Jerusalem could not really be reconciled. There could not really be a synthesis. So in his view, Christian philosophy was something that really couldn't happen because um, philosophy, you must be it takes take a kind of rationalist approach to things, and that precludes uh, bringing revelation into the discussion, and vice versa. Now, he doesn't say that uh, revelation is impossible, but he says the two are in this uh, irreconcilable tension. And in fact, for Strauss, that tension between Athens and Jerusalem and the back and forth between those two things in Western history are is, is the thing that really gives Western 
civilization its historic vitality, that there's this fruitful uh, interchange and uh, conversation between these positions throughout Western history. So his later followers picked up on this idea as well and tried to uh, push that uh, dialectic. And then Strauss also controversially is known for his theory of esoteric writing. And this is another way in which he had the kind of idiosyncratic way of interpreting great books. He would say that, well, we know that Socrates was judicially murdered by ancient Athens. That you know they, they didn't like what he had to say, so they executed him. They made him drink hemlock and poison. And uh, later philosophers took the hint that if they wanted to save their own skins, they couldn't say anything that was obviously too hostile to existing regimes. So later philosophers, I mean, starting with Plato, I mean, almost immediately, uh, learned how to hide their true meaning. They would write in an obscure way, and their work could be read on two different levels. The, the exoteric level, which would be sort of the plain surface meaning that wouldn't get them into trouble with the authorities, and the esoteric uh, level, which would be something that only other philosophers and other followers of this particular way of thinking would be able to interpret. So uh, what, what Strauss is saying basically here is that when you read a philosopher like Aristotle or John Locke or someone like that, um, if you're just if you do do a cursory reading of what they're saying, you're not really going to get it. You've got to uh, read down uh, and drill down into these deeper levels of meaning that are not uh, meaning that are not immediately obvious. Now, of course, this is a very controversial um, idea as well, because what Strauss is doing is basically coming along to people who don't share this idea and say, oh, you just don't get Locke, or you just don't get Plato. And this has caused a lot of debate as well. Again, Strauss's later followers pushed this idea, uh, in some cases, to extremes. Well, Strauss's followers divide into different camps, uh, and the most um, popular way of, de of describing them is say we have East Coast Straussians and West Coast Straussians who are active from the 1960s onward pretty much. The East Coast Straussians um, are generally considered to be more kind of introspective, and their writings focus more on a kind of individualistic uh, concern with the philosophical life and how the philosophical life is the life that really gives meaning in the Socratic tradition, you know, uh, so Socrates said at his trial, the unexamined life is not worth living. Well, the East Coast Straussians appear to be more about the, the individual's uh, reflection and, and the philosophical virtues. So they are not really uh, that involved with debating in the public square for the most part. The best known um, East Coast Straussian is Alan Bloom, whose dates are 1930 to 1992. And he did make a big splash in the 1980s with his book, uh, The Closing of the American Mind, which is considered to be, uh, by a lot of people, to be a, a classic of uh, cultural commentary. The West Coast Straussians are the ones who have been um, a lot more controversial, particularly among other conservatives and uh, libertarians. Because the West Coast Straussians are more obviously political, and they take Strauss's idea of um, this tension between the modern and the ancient philosophy and apply a lot of it directly to the United States. The West Coast Straussians tend to emphasize the United States as being this unique nation in the history of the world, that it is uh, unlike all the other uh, historic nations that are based on ethnicity or language or something like that. The United States of America is a proposition nation. It is founded on these ideals. Now, Harry Jaffa is the most significant of the West Coast Straussians. He taught at uh, Claremont McKenna College in California. His dates are 1918 to 2015. Now, uh, Jaffa made a uh, big waves in the 1950s with a book on the Lincoln-Douglas debates in which he argued that Abraham Lincoln essentially refounded the United States, that the, the U.S. had originally been uh, founded in 1776 on sort of uh, 
Lockean principles. But then Lincoln comes along and refounds the United States on more classical and Aristotelian principles. And of course, for Strauss and his followers, these ancient philosophers are better than the modern political philosophers. So Aristotle is better than Locke. And Jaffa says, now uh, Lincoln has really put the United States on the best footing in this idea of equality. Le uh, Jaffa talks uh, at great length about how equality is really a conservative principle. And of course, um, the entire thrust of the conservative tradition up to that point with figures like Russell Kirk, um, Murray Rothbard also uh, from the libertarian side would say that, uh, no, people are not created equal. Egalitarianism, in Rothbard's words, is a revolt against nature. But here is Jaffa saying, no, equality is a conservative value. So this is a very controversial uh, idea on the right. Later on, um, Jaffa came back and wrote another book in which he tried to push this Aristotelian understanding of uh, the founding documents even further back to the founding. He, I mean, he argued later that the founding fathers would not have read John Locke esoterically, the way Strauss interpreted him. Instead, they would have uh, in, interpreted his uh, exoteric meaning, which would have made the founding fathers read Locke in a more Aristotelian way. So he tries to claim the founding fathers as part of this egalitarian vision uh, as well. So again, um, a very controversial figure, but this influence of Jaffa and his uh, followers has been very significant on the mainstream American conservative movement in the later part of the 20th century because the idea of liberal democracy becomes more and more prominent in the writings of, of Straussians and neoconservatives in opposition to the um, earlier conservative emphasis and libertarian emphasis on the American founding as a constitutional republic that was not a democracy. So the preservation of the hierarchies and the uh, role of the states and all that Jaffa and his followers want to sort of, um, you know, steamroll all of that and just say, no, we've just got the one big United States of America that's founded on these glorious propositions of all men are created equal and so on. So this has caused a lot of uh, infighting on the right and you know, from the later part of the 20th century up until the present. OK, so with those um, Straussians out of the way, at least for the moment, let's turn to the 1960s and the circumstances that gave rise to the neoconservative movement. In the early 1960s, of course, the conservatives are very much on the defensive in a number of ways. Uh, the civil rights movement is one that most conservatives were not on board with. National Review was quite critical of the uh, civil rights movement, although they, you know, the National Review writers did really wrestle with the question of civil rights, but they ultimately came down uh, on the position that we've got to give uh, respect to the traditional structure of Southern institutions and we've got to maintain order and that sort of thing. Uh, there's also the conservative position, which is one that uh, libertarians shared along with uh, Barry Goldwater in the 1964 candidacy that um, acts like the Civil Rights Act of 1964 are a tremendous extension of federal power, which in addition to being unconstitutional in all likelihood, is one that is likely to pave the way for more federal intrusions into um, into the lives of ordinary everyday citizens. And, and this is the, the harbinger of something much worse to come down the road. So conservatives are on the defensive uh, during the civil rights movement, and then they uh, are unable to stop the passage of some of the great society programs during the Johnson administration, particularly the passage of uh, Medicare and the uh, passage of the various welfare uh, programs that begin to transfer direct cash payments to people who are considered to be below the poverty line by the federal government. So the conservatives are, uh, again, very suspicious of the growing federal involvement in these areas. And also they are concerned that this is going to um, have harmful social effects, that it's going to remove incentives for work and encourage indolence and the like. But by the late 1960s, some of the social trends are providing conservatives an opportunity for a counterattack. Uh, we've got 
the black radicalism, the Black Panthers and so on in the late 1960s, the new left and the violent student protests, um, not only in America, but in Europe as well. And this is one of the things that, of course, leads to the election of Richard Nixon in 1968 as president on a sort of law and order platform. Now, the conservatives did not like Nixon for the most part. They knew he was not one of them, despite his anti-communist uh, credentials. But um, they said that, well, probably Nixon you know, may end up being better than, uh, than whoever the Democrats would have put up there in 1968, particularly the conservatives who were in favor of uh, waging the Vietnam War. They certainly thought that Nixon would be better than um, Eugene McCarthy or whoever else the Democrats uh, managed to put up. So they said that it was becoming increasingly clear that leftist policies in the 1960s had led to this social turmoil, had led to all these problems, and that this is giving us um, an opening. So this brings us to the neoconservatives. Now, neoconservatism is represented by uh, another group of leftists to defect over to the right. Now, we had the, uh, the anti-communist leftists coming over in the 1940s and early 1950s, the figures like James Burnham. Well, this is another group of leftists. You know, they're coming over in the late 1960s and early 1970s, you know, about 20 years later. And many of these uh, guys were people who had attacked the so-called new conservatives in the 1950s. They had written books and articles saying these, these conservatives like uh, Russell Kirk, William F. Buckley, these guys are... Um, messed up in the head. We need to psychoanalyze them because obviously no sane person could advocate the things that they're advocating. But then these um, liberals became disillusioned by the various uh, policy failures, particularly on the domestic front in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, Irving Kristol, one of the most prominent neoconservatives, fam famously defined a neoconservative as a liberal who had been mugged by reality. So the failure of these idealistic programs from the Kennedy and Johnson era uh, is turning them over to say, okay, well, maybe the conservatives do have something useful to say. So I've listed on the slide here a few of the characteristics of neoconservatism. Uh, most of the prominent neoconservatives came from a, a social science background. They were often sociologists who had a disciplined approach, a statistical approach to trying to um, you know, quantify social problems. And they continued that methodology. This gave uh, the conservative movement, once neoconservatives have come on, on board, sort of the patina of um, scientific rigor. One of the criticisms of the conservative writers had been because they were very often figures like Russell Kirk, who wrote in a sort of philosophical mode, that uh, they weren't rigorous because in the 20th century, uh, the methodology of the natural sciences was all the rage. So these neoconservatives could bring their statistical studies and all that sort of thing and uh, give the conservative movement, uh, again, heightened respectability in the mainstream uh, conversation. Neoconservatives, uh, many of whom had been former communists, did accept the idea that uh, social and economic inequality was acceptable and perhaps even a good thing, that it could um, you know, create a division of labor that was useful for everybody. However, they continued to support the welfare state. They thought that the welfare state was, was a, a helpful thing, that it was the safety net that would avoid people from falling into abject poverty, and so they wanted to preserve uh, features of the New Deal, uh, for example. And then finally, on foreign policy, the neoconservatives were hawks. Um, some of them did not start out this way, but by the mid-1970s, late 1970s, most of the neoconservatives were very definitely taking a hawkish stance in most foreign policy questions. We'll come back to the foreign policy uh, angle in a minute, but for the moment, I want to look at a couple of the prominent neoconservative figures. Um, the guy who's sometimes described as the godfather of neoconservatism is Irving Kristol. His dates are 1920 to 2009. And in his youth, he was a communist. He was a Trotskyist. Uh, however, after uh, World War II, in which he, he fought, he moved away from communism and 
in the late 1940s, early 1950s, as a journalist, he was making more and more anti-communist statements, but he still remained on the left politically. He broke with the left in the early 1970s over the Vietnam question. Uh, he, he voted for Nixon in 1972 instead of George McGovern, and because he was a very well-known journalist already at that point, this caused a lot of uh, conversation uh, in leftist circles. He contributed to a number of uh, influential periodicals that were actively writing about um, public policy questions and foreign policy. I've listed several of them on the slide here. A commentary, Encounter, Public Interest, and for many years he was a senior editor of the Wall Street Journal. He also wrote several books which were often uh, collections of essays. Um, some of these are On the Democratic Idea in America, Two Cheers for Capitalism, and uh, Reflections of a Neoconservative. He later, in the 1990s, wrote uh, Neoconservatism, the Autobiography of an Idea. So Crystal is one of the neoconservatives who did not reject the label. Some of the other uh, neocons rejected uh, the label neoconservative. They didn't want that to, uh, particularly after neoconservative, um, the, the term came under a lot of criticism in the first decade of the 21st century. A lot of people say, oh, there's no such thing as a neoconservative. Uh, and those of you who have been around a while reading uh, the uh, conservative and libertarian journals and, and the press may remember some of, the, some of this posturing in the first decade of the 21st century. But Crystal always embraced the term. He said, yes, I am a neoconservative, and here's uh, you know, what I take that to mean. So he held a lot of the positions that I've just been describing on the earlier slide that um, the welfare state was perhaps a good thing, but it needed to be reformed. It needed to be really a safety net and not something that could create a comfortable life of government handouts for the people at the bottom of society and so on. Daniel Patrick Moynihan is another prominent neoconservative. His dates are 1927 to 2003. He first rose to prominence as uh, a bureaucrat in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. He was the Assistant Secretary of Labor in the 1960s under uh, Johnson. And then he also uh, was an advisor to Richard Nixon during his presidency. He was an ambassador uh, to the United Nations and to India. And then uh, later on was a senator for four terms for the state of New York but, uh, from the Democratic Party. Now Moynihan first became a prominent or notorious, depending on your perspective, for an internal study that he wrote for the Department of Labor when he was Assistant Secretary of Labor. Um, the study was that was then later leaked and it, and it was all over the papers. This was in the late 1960s and the study was called The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, which uh, Moynihan said that we've got this problem with the uh, new welfare program in that you know, poverty had gone down to this very low level by the time we introduced the program for welfare, and we thought that we were going to eliminate poverty completely. But now, after this program has been in place a few years, we see that, in fact, poverty is sort of ticking back up again, and it's disproportionately among um, black families. And he noticed some common features of this. He said there's a dis disproportionate uh, number of black uh, people who are recipients of the welfare, and they are uh, single-parent households, uh, households where there is no father present. And he is starting to connect the dots here and say, oh, look, it looks like we have created an incentive for uh, black mothers to remain unwed because if they get married, the, the welfare benefits are cut off. So they now have an incentive to uh, not to marry the fathers of their children. And of course, this invited all kinds of criticism of Moynihan. It's in response to Moynihan that we first get this rhetoric of blaming the victim, that Moynihan was accused of blaming the victim. And of course, that trope has been has remained a staple of uh, leftist criticism of uh, conservative uh, policy proposals uh, ever since then. But Moynihan uh, stuck to his guns and in fact fired back fairly effectively at his critics and certainly didn't uh, harm his political career very much. Now, he was a, a very hawkish neoconservative in the mid-1970s. When he was ambassador to the United Nations, he actually uh, proposed that when the 
and other ambassadors from different countries would make anti-American statements in the General Assembly of the UN, uh, Moynihan went to Gerald Ford and said, uh, President Ford, we need to cut the aid uh, of to the countries of all these guys who are making anti-American statements in the United Nations. So he, he was trying to be very assertive as to the United States' role in the world and wanted it to be uh, perceived as, as being positive. However, later on in his career, he did uh, moderate some on the foreign policy. Uh, in the dwindling stages of the Cold War, he came to the conclusion that the Soviet Union was not really the massive threat that other neoconservatives thought that it was. And then after the Cold War ended, um, he opposed U.S. intervention overseas. He voted, as a senator, he voted against authorization of military force in Iraq for the first Gulf War. So he does moderate a little later on, but in the 1960s and 1970s, it's one of the most prominent neoconservatives and the first neoconservative to be elected to a high office like the U.S. Senate. Another very significant neoconservative is Norman Podharitz, who was born in 1930. He was the editor of Commentary Magazine from 1960 to 1995, so that was his primary organ of disseminating his opinion. Uh, started off on the left again, but moved right in the mid-1960s, and uh, is best known for his uh, jabs at the left. The books that he wrote, um, particularly the, the most famous one is called Making It in the late 1960s. It's kind of an expose in which he said, Look, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be an American. I'm happy that my talents have brought me uh, success, that I'm a fairly well-known guy and that I've been financially successful. And he says that uh, there are all these people on the left who uh, posture a lot about not caring about money and not wanting to, uh, not, not placing a value on material success. But he says they're all lying. They're all hypocrites. And so he uh, attracted a lot of um uh, criticism for that, but he was sort of pulling the rug up, uh, uh, lifting up or pulling the lid off, I should say, and say, look at here, you know, these guys on the left who make all these statements about their, their piety and, and their, uh, embrace of the, of simplicity and all that. It's all a lie. Uh, and then later on, he wrote other books. Um, two of them were called Breaking Ranks and Ex Friends. You can tell from the title there that he's talking about his history with people on the left and saying that, um, you know, these, these liberals that I, who I used to consider my friends, they've all kind of excommunicated me now, uh, because I am willing to tell the truth about their hypocrisy and so on. So, of course, this was, uh, all very pleasurable reading for conservatives in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, making it is considered to be, you know, one of the, the great, uh, kind of political memoirs of, of the 60s. In the 1990s, uh, Potharitz debated William F. Buckley uh, over the question of anti-Semitism in uh, the ranks of conservatism. Potharitz and Crystal and a number of the other prominent neoconservatives were Jewish. And when Patrick Buchanan and others come on the scene in the 1990s saying, we don't want to go to war with Iraq, there is no vital American interest in Iraq. Uh, the only people that are going to be helped by us attacking Iraq are, um, are people in Israel. Uh, we're, we're essentially becoming this kind of an adjunct of Israeli foreign policy. And, and this position was denounced as being anti-Semitic uh, by, by Potharitz. Now, Buckley came along and said, no, 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 you mean you, you can legitimately cri uh, criticize Israel without uh, being considered anti-Semitic. But this was uh, another thing where the, the neoconservatives often attacked the traditional conservatives, accusing them of anti-Semitism whenever they displayed any kind of reluctance uh, to go all out in support of the state of Israel. Well, that brings us uh, to a consideration of neoconservatives and foreign policy. And as I said earlier, in general, the neoconservative position on foreign policy is very hawkish, very aggressive, although it's always couched in euphemism. They would, uh, neoconservatives would say things like, we need to have a strong foreign policy. When you scratch the surface of what a strong foreign policy means, and it becomes clear that what they mean is it's a very interventionist foreign policy. The United States military needs to be all around the world doing all kinds of different things. And um, one of the bedrock positions of neoconservatism is, as, I, as I've mentioned, the United States must support Israel, must always intervene on behalf of Israel whenever uh, it gets into a conflict in the Middle East. Part of every single issue of commentary was devoted to what's happening in Israel and what the United States ought to do for Israel. In the 1980s, when we had, and, and 70s, I should say, um, 
the neoconservatives were writing a whole lot about Iran and Iraq. Of course, in 1979, we had the uh, Iranian Revolution, where the uh, the Shah, the ruler of Iran, who was ha had been supported by the United States government for a number of years, um, fell and was replaced by uh, Islamic fundamentalists. And this leads to the Iran-Iraq War. Um, as you may know, Saddam Hussein in, in Iraq was, was our guy during the Iran-Iraq War because we were angry with Iran for overthrowing our guy, the Shah. Um, but the, the neoconservatives were always there monitoring the situation and saying, here's what we need to do now because this will be the best thing for Israel. And whenever, as I said, there, were, there seemed to be any, any possibility of the United States government wavering with its um, commitment to advancing the interests of the state of Israel, the neoconservatives were quick to jump on and say, no, we've, we've got to help out Israel. Uh, the <clears throat> neoconservatives were all also very um, anti-communist and very hawkish in their anti-communism. Although some of the neoconservatives had not really been big proponents of the Vietnam War, after Saigon fell, in 1975, and, and the stories about Pol Pot and Cambodia and the genocide and all of that were coming out, uh, many neoconservatives said, well, whatever the failings of the United States were in Vietnam, uh, the people there were, were much better off with us there than they were you know, after we left. So uh, they said that we, we can't trust that uh, any of these other hotspots around the world will resolve themselves in a beneficial way uh, if the United States stands back and, and, and doesn't take an active role. With uh, the, the Carter presidency, the neoconservatives were critical of the emphasis on human rights as an important determiner of foreign policy. So they <clears throat> criticized Carter's partial withdrawal of support for the Shah in Iran and said that, no, we, we should have kept on you know, backing the Shah and stopping him from from being overthrown in 1979, and when Carter was trying to, um, you know, ease up on some of the regimes uh, in the communist bloc that seemed like they might be uh, improving the human rights situation, the neoconservatives said, "No, no, no, we've, we've got to stay strong in our anti-communism." The neoconservatives argued against the SALT agreements, the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks of the 1970s, and. Uh, Gene Kirkpatrick, one of the prominent neoconservatives, formulated a distinction between authoritarian and totalitarian regimes that the neoconservatives would often use in the 70s and 80s. Kirkpatrick said, the United States can never uh, be nice to totalitarian regimes like the Soviet Union. But there are other regimes out there that uh, are, are maybe unsavory to some extent, but not totalitarian. Maybe they're, they're simply authoritarian regimes. They have some kind of military strongman in power, and uh, he doesn't give his citizens full civil liberties, but it's not a totalitarian state. And if, if we can make a deal with those kinds of regimes that will aid us in the worldwide struggle against communism, then we should do that. So particularly in places like Latin America, El Salvador, Nicaragua, that had these military dictatorships, the neoconservatives would say, well, we just need to hold our nose and, and support these guys, particularly if they have uh, communist or socialist revolutionaries active within their borders, because we certainly cannot tolerate any more communist or socialist states in the Western Hemisphere. So that was how the neocons uh, approached foreign policy. Okay, so to sum up this lecture, We've got uh, two forces that have an influence on the conservative movement that we've discussed. First was Leo Strauss and his followers who are known as Straussians. They influenced the conservative movement with, uh, with, with their approach to political science, political philosophy, and especially in the case of the Jaffaites, uh, this emphasis on uh, a liberal democracy that, that is highly centralized, which they liked. And that becomes a, a trope within certain uh, certain uh, facets of the conservative movement. The traditionalists reject that uh, view of the American founding. The libertarians certainly reject it as well. Neoconservatives come over to the right in the 1960s and 1970s. Their expertise is on social issues. They do a lot of statistical studies that um, help to 
make the case for reform of the welfare state, although the neoconservatives don't want to get rid of the welfare state entirely. And then the neoconservatives also come to be influential in foreign policy discussions, and uh, particularly with the um, anti-communist position of the conservative movement, and also bringing in this emphasis on that the United States must support the state of Israel. Thanks for watching. All right, that is the great and heroic Jason Jewell, whom I need to get back on the show. we got to get Jason Jewell back. All right, well, anyway, man, I'm tired from recording all these episodes in advance, so I'm going to go to sleep now. It's uh, after 3 o'clock in the morning, the day that I'm doing this, so um, I should probably get in bed so that I can accomplish something tomorrow. So instead of just talking aimlessly here, I think I'm going to go do that. And I'll see you, you know, tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.